press. We'll still know here. See here. Cold spring. Testing. One, two, three. Testing. One, two, three. Attitude adjustments for you and me. Testing, testing. Let me know when you hear and see me. Come on. Come on, last stream. Okay, I think we're on. We're good? Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's class. Today's class is on attitude in dog training. And this is our 5.0 version. And I believe this is an important lecture and section, important section of our triangle that we can see here that is part, major part of the secret sauce to being a good professional dog trainer. In my opinion, one of the most important actually. Um, and it's on the lower half of our foundation, which really shows that how important it is in order to be successful with all the hands-on parts of the dog training actually. We wanna have the, the correct um, attitude before we, before we move forward. So let's see, I'm gonna move over to our outline over here and show you what we're gonna be working on. Um, our objectives are what is attitude from a social psychology perspective? Um, why is it important for professional dog trainers to understand and what are things to consider when attempting to create or alter an attitude? So let's see if I can get these objectives done for you. So first things first is what is attitude? Um, the definition I like best is a settled way of thinking or feeling that typically is reflected in a person's behavior. And I like charts, so I made this little chart to show really the three components of an attitude and how they're related to each other, which is they're basically all, all interrelated with, the, with each other. If as one of these three components change, it it is most likely to to change or move or or adjust the other components of of attitude um there's something called the abc model in social psychology which consists of the affective side of things which is what we feel that's the emotional component of our of our attitude um that's the settled way of feeling that reflects our behavior. And the cognitive part is the what we think, which is based off of our experience mostly, the, um, the knowledge that we have gathered in our head based off of our own experience. And between the way that we, we think about something, what we know about something, and also how it makes us feel, um, that reflects the more important aspect of behavior. All right, because um, ultimately it's the behavior of the client, the person handling the dog that we're most concerned of um, as, as a dog trainer. But what you will also see is behavior, behavior will also influence um, how we feel and what we think. So getting a good understanding of this, which some of us, it's one of those things that it's gonna seem almost it's like common sense, but if you don't think about it, you don't um, you don't make it a part of your training plans, and you don't really re don't really consider it. And I, I I love this subject, so so let's move on over here. I did a couple examples over here to show how they're interrelated, and one could lead to the other. And I highlighted I I highlighted the sentences to pair up with um, what aspect of the of the attitude model, the ABC model, it represents. So in this first sentence over here, I put, not sentence, little paragraph, three sentences. It says, here's an example of someone who says, I think pit bulls are so cute. I read that they were used as nanny dogs, all right? So this is what someone thinks, what they think based off of their experience and what they've read. 
Now, how they feel, under starting off with cognitive, they make me feel warm and fuzzy inside when I see them. Therefore, the behavior is I will adopt one and snuggle on the couch with it. All right. Now we could show another person um, that has different experience and knowledge with the pit bull and says, I know someone who was injured by a pit bull. And the way that they feel is when I see a pit bull, I get scared. So therefore, their behavior is I signed a petition to have them banned in our city. Let's move on to another one showing now these are both in the same order, but different experiences. Now, here's one. Here's a couple that start with behavior. Um, I volunteer at the local shelter and walk a pit bull. So we're starting more with the behavior. Um, what they gained from that is he is always happy to see me and very affection, very affectionate. Therefore, the way this person feels is I get angry when people say they are dangerous dogs. Now you could see, and if we start comparing some of these is, um, like especially this one with the ones before, it's very hard to mix and match, um, the, you know, exchange, you know, exchange the way they feel between these two or, or, or what they think about something or even what their experience. It's just not going to make sense. This is why I said that they always go together, that we find these things going, to, these three things going together. And I, I put another one, I put another one over here, which um, reflects uh, more like the way I feel, right? I am studying to be a dog trainer and research all dog breeds before I train them. That's what I do, right? Um, I have learned that all dog breeds have certain tendencies and that every dog also has individual temperaments. That's what I know. And then the green is the way I feel is I admire the athleticism of pit bulls and feel they can be great dogs with knowledgeable and responsible owners. Sorry for the typo there. All right. So this is one to give an example of how they relate to each other and how it varies. Everything is going to vary depending on the person's own experience, right? Everyone, everyone, this is not just how you feel about dogs. You can see this as you're watching the stream, you could relate this to politics and all kinds of things, right? We're all products of our own experiences and it is vast. So every client you're going to work with has a different background and what's, but this background that they have ultimately is going to lead to different behavioral tendencies. And, um, and when I first started training, and this is how, how this section evolved with, um, with attitude. When I first started training and I realized that I can do better training when I, when I behave a certain way towards the dogs, right? If you look at some of my old training videos on the wall, right? I had, which I still feel strongly about, I was... I would teach the clients, you know, you have to be patient with the dogs. You have to have, you have to have respect for the dogs. Um, these things were really important. I would teach them, like, this is how you have to act in order to be successful with training the dog. But the problem with that is, is what if they already came with, um, you know, different knowledge about how they felt about even their own dogs and how they even felt about their home, their own dogs, right? They had people are coming to you and some of them, they were dealing, they've been bitten by their own dogs or they're, they have been having hardships because of their dog, the issues that their dogs were, were having, and they feel a certain way. They may feel that their dog has been from their perspective, that their dog has been a jerk or their dog has been a dick and their dog and they're, you know, and, and they're going to be thinking all these things. And then it's very hard to fit that into someone who feels this way about their dogs, but we want them to behave a certain way. So that is why attitude it's attitude is important in foundation style dog training to be placed in a very specific spot in order for it to work correctly. And which is right over here. I like to put it um, right above diagnosis. And the way this breaks down, for example, is that if we understand us as the trainer, 
right? Us as the trainer, if we believe in being ethical and we believe in being um, the, the least intrusive to a client's, um, to the client's relationship with their dog and the least diversive, um, it's going to help. It's going to, it's going to lead to a plan, first of all, that's going to want to build an attitude where the owner is going to want to do the same thing with the dog. Now, the ethology aspect is, of course, if we do not know our ethology and we do not understand dog behavior and specific breed behavior and the specific behavior of a certain dog, we're not able to teach that to the client and, and have the correct diagnosis for the dog in order to give them the right knowledge which is going to work better to change the behavior all right so we have to really work on we do need to work on what the people feel about their dog how the way that they feel what they think about their dog so they know oh your dog's not just trying to be a jerk the dog has certain basic needs that aren't being taken care of right and some of these behaviors are natural to the dog. The dog was born with some of these behaviors and you're misinterpreting it. And um, your dog is conflicted and it is normal for the dog to show aggression in this situation. And then we can then for start changing the way the owner feels about the dog, all right? That the dog's not being a dick. The dog is being fearful in a certain situation, all right? Th things like this. And then this helps to shape the way that they are going to be ready to train with the dog and they're going to have more patience they're going to be more dedicated to their dog they're going to we're going to have a better client we're going to be more more successful with the with the client all right now um you can see how not for, if we do not have a good base over here we can easily it can easily lead to lead to incompatible attitudes with what we want to accomplish um, with the dog. For example, yes, you will see this. This is actually pretty common that um, as a trainer, if you have a limited education, um, a lot of trainers resort to vilifying the dog. All right. They're calling the dog. If you see a professional, I, I always cringe when I hear a professional dog trainer. Um, telling the clients that their dog is just being a jerk or a dick or something like that, et cetera, instead of really understanding and explaining what is going on with the dog. Because again, this will lead to the behavior. Attitude leads to behavior and we need the right attitude from the owner for them to have the devotion to even stick it through with the dog, manage the dog correctly. So the dog, the dog is going to be comfortable and lead and 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 they're much more likely to provide the basic needs of a dog that they do not think is a jerk or they do not think is a dick or that kind of stuff. Also, what you see is another problem I see, um, which can which can um, lead to a poor progression of a training plan is by is by turning the dogs into an unemotional creature and create and creating that attitude. So I see things like where where trainers are not necessarily calling the dogs jerk or jerks or dicks, but they start um, turning them into unemotional creatures. They say things like the dogs are self-serving. No, it does not love you. It is just doing that because it's going to get a treat or it's going to get. Um, they really sort of like devalue the dog as an emotional as an emotional creature and um, that too can lead again to behaviors towards the dog which are not as sinopraxic and looking out for the dog's happiness as well as yours all right a lot of these could lead to behavior plans that are going to be more um more correlated to just making the getting results for the client and making sure they they solve a client's problem but not really looking at the contentment of the dog, which will not be as solid of solid as solid of a plan, you know, a little and it diverge a little bit from just because I see more and more of this, which turn in the dogs into unemotional creatures. Um, and we see, you know, less praise and more just clickers and e-collars and stuff like that with the dogs is we have to remember that 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 emotions. All right. Um, things like fear 
and even love. You know, these are primitive. These are primitive emotions. Nowhere, there's, there's no evidence anywhere that says even bugs, you know, show the same sort of hormonal changes and stuff like that when they're, when they're fear, you know, when they're, when they're fear and fearful, when they are feeling fearful, fearful. And if you read studies, you do know that canines will go out of their way to protect other members of their pack and their puppies, put themselves in harm, in, in harm's way. And it is directly related and correlated to what you would even see, see us doing, right? These primitive things, emotions, attachment, love, being happy when they're reunited, all these kind of things is, these are primitive. These, these are, these are, um, these are primitive things that we have, right? This is not the highly evolved part of, of humans. So, so remember, we do not want to create an attitude where these are just, where these are just robots. Um, next is oversimplifying a dog's capabilities, you know, um, um, or even just creating a, creating an attitude that this is, this is more than oversimplifying the dog's capability. Sometimes you'll see even science just being, being twisted where we hear things like punishment is abusive to dogs and, and you get very, very far extremes where attitudes are built, um, to try to get clients to just think that the dogs cannot handle any type of punishment, punishment equals abuse and, and that they cannot learn through punishment and also be happy, stuff like this. But this all, this can all start um, with the attitude, all right? And this is, as a professional dog trainer, it's not just about the clients. You, you need to know the other professionals that you, that you are working with because really a lot of the clients that you're working with a lot of their attitudes are formed also from um, information that they gained from other professionals, from other professionals too. So in order to be successful and to navigate your way um, um, successfully as a professional dog trainer, you want to understand attitude. You want to understand how attitude is formed. You even want to understand why other professional dog trainers have the attitudes that they have. And if you understand why the other professional dog trainers have the attitudes that you have, it's easier to kind of reverse engineer what is going on and order to make solutions and change attitudes that correlate with what you're trying to do with the dog, right? With the client and the dog, you're looking to create a sinopraxic relationship where you're keeping both of them in mind, they're both happy, and you're getting results. You're giving clients what they paid for. They have a problem, you're gonna solve it, but you wanna enjoy it, you wanna enjoy the process, you want the owner to enjoy the process, and you want the dog to enjoy the process. And what else could anyone want more than that? All right, that's that's what we're that's what we're looking for here, and that's the that's the motivation be behind learning, behind learning attitude. So, um, when we have incompatible behavior, our attitude leads to, if we have the wrong attitude that leads to the wrong behavior from the clients, right? So it can lead to poor management, poor leadership, poor consideration of basic needs, poor behavioral plans because a dominance aggression or fear aggression or a protective aggression or resource guarding is going to be misdiagnosed as things like the dog just being a dick or a jerk or the dog just making wrong decisions and not a deep understanding. Um, it will, uh, the poor attitude and behavior can lead to a lack of implementing Lima properly, skipping steps and a loss overall potential results and a sinopraxic outcome. Um, so we need to go forward. We need our owner to be dedicated which with the right, if they have the wrong attitude and they feel the wrong way about a dog that is not behaving the way that they would like, they're, they're less likely to be dedicated if they don't feel the correct way towards the dog. Also, um, we also have to consider that we don't want the owner to have bias about training tools and techniques that do not reflect scientific law. So, so, so understanding attitude, is um is going to gonna help with all these things now common ways that attitude leads to behavior when you come to a client 
These are the most common ways that they're gonna have an attitude that may not reflect what you need in them in order to get the behavior that you need from them, which is the way they're gonna act towards the dog, what they're willing to do, things like this. Keep in mind, this explains things for a lot of people, is a lot of people's attitude is related to an event, and often a very memorable event, and sometimes a traumatic event. For example, if a client, if you plan on using prong collars or e-collars in your training plan, and this person with their dog already had a bad experience with their trainer, or no, or witnessed a dog that had a bad experience with an e-collar or prong collar. That single event can can alter the attitude and what they're willing to do from day one, and that's normal. All right, that's going to be normal. The next thing is just norms, how they will be perceived by others, depending on the individual person and the people that they associate with, the community that they're in, there are going to be different norms, okay? So, it, and you can get different extremes, right? I've been in situations and environments where, where handlers with their dogs felt like they would not be perceived as a good handler if they used treats in their training. When I went to a police dog seminar, for example, like, oh, no, no, I don't want to be using treats. And my mentor told me not to use treats. And none of these guys use treats. And on another extreme, you could be in another, you could be in another environment where it's the norm to not use prong collars or e-collars or stuff like that or, or any type of training collars. And part of what someone is willing to their attitude, a lot of that has also been created by the norms, right? The norms of what they what they have been around. And also, it's their attitude is based off of the perception of their control over their behavior, all right? Um, if you tell them to do something, and does it even seem possible to that person? People generally are gonna create an attitude that's gonna reflect of what they think they are capable of doing, all right? Instead of them saying, well, in theory, that sounds great, but I really can't do that. And they're gonna create an attitude based off of what they knew, know can do, that they can do, which is also often related to their past behavior of what they've already been doing and modeling what they have seen people that they have respect for or, and and that, that has also been doing. It's like, oh, this is the way I've seen, this is the way it was always done, and I'm okay with it, and this is what their attitude is. And their attitude is also going to reflect their intentions. So a lot of this you'll see with, um, with professional trainers, and depending how public they are, is, is their attitude may reflect what's most important to them, which may be their public perception, as compared to someone who's privately trying to solve a problem on on their own. You know, they, they need a fix, they need to go on with their life. Like what are their intentions, right? Attitudes, you're gonna come across different attitudes that generally shaped behind these different things. All right. Now, behavior, this can also work the other way around. Is um, someone's and, and this, this, this is reflective of, of this too, right? So, so their attitude is gonna to lead to the behavior. It's what we're talking about here. If they have this atti these attitudes that were changed, they're gonna do things a certain way. Now, important things to know about behavior, behavior that was done first, that can then influence someone's attitude about, about how they do things. The two most popular ones are called um, foot in the door and role playing which are which can explain a lot of how behavior influences an attitude that sometimes seems like even far-fetched of how can someone be doing something like this so i'll give you an example um foot in the door let's say if someone handles their dog extremely rough or there are cases of police dog handlers there are you know there are certain um, agencies that 
have very old school, out of date methods, and they have police dog handlers that wanted to be in the canine unit because they did like dogs, they wanted to do it. And you see something common in a lot of circles like this, where we have um, foot in the door, where they're asked to do something a little, a, a little bit on the side of what they normally wouldn't do. Um, where there's these cases with police dog handlers where they start off maybe just giving a dog a harder correction than they thought they were going to have to do being a police dog handler. And if they were doing that on day one and the first couple of days of training, they're much more likely to be get more and more rough with the dog after they have been used to doing something and they're doing a little uh, doing a little bit of it at all. The small things can become bigger things. And then once they're hanging a dog and making it choke and kicking it in the ribs, which is common in some of these circles, um, that's called the foot in the door. That's called the foot in the door. The other the other thing which is a behavior can lead to attitude is role playing where if even if someone didn't necessarily believe or it was not their attitude to act a certain way, they are given a role where they have to be doing things um, a certain way. To give you an example, I mean, I talked about this in another stream. I remember my experience years ago with Victoria Stilwell, who was on TV, and she told me that she was okay with punishment as long as someone knew what they were doing, et cetera, et cetera. She told me this off camera, said she's okay with e-collars, okay with prong collars, as long as someone knows what they're doing. But her role on TV and her sponsors demanded that she was purely positive. And she plays that role. And I believe she played that role so much that it is now her attitude, all right? She at least leads people to believe or she has that attitude that all this stuff is bad and you will see you can also see this too if someone gets a job as um um at a at some sort of dog training company that only does positive reinforcement or something like that is they play the role even if they did not necessarily believe that even if they did not think that it made sense that a dog could do all these things um, without any type of punishment whatsoever, they do the role first and then it becomes their, their attitude. And this can also go the other way around. Again, talking about police dog handlers and stuff like that. If they are taught, if they jump in and they say, this is how you have to act as a canine handler, sometimes even if that's not how they were, act, they were treating their own personal dog, um, when they're role playing, it can become, it can become the attitude, reflect the attitude, and the person will believe, or at least sound like they believe what they're saying, which was often not the case before they role played or started doing the behavior. Now, which adds to this, which you need to be. Um, familiar with is these two things. I put two things here. There's cognitive dissonance and there's confirmation bias. Um, cognitive dissonance is we do not like this thing to be out of whack. All right. So let's take the police dog handler. He wanted to be a police dog handler. He loved his dog. I'd say he has some, I don't know, a golden retriever at home and a beagle and had a German shepherd of high drive. And he, before he became a police dog handler, he thought um, dogs should be treated with respect and we should not be, we shouldn't hit dogs, we shouldn't be rough with them. And his behavior reflected that um, at home with his dogs. Now he becomes a police canine handler. And because let's say he was in, not all police handlers are like this, but if it's a poor program that doesn't really have anyone capable of teaching, how to handle high drive dogs. He could be in a situation now where he was role playing and he's acting a certain way, which does not reflect how he really feels and what he thought before he started doing it. Now what happens is cognitive dissonance is it's uncomfortable for us to have conflicting gears over here. And cognitive dissonance causes us 
to alter and add things to the other gears so that they better reflect. So they all work together. They all seem to relate to each other. So in this case with the police dog handler that I'm talking about, what they'll do is they'll start to um, add, add more reasons, all right? It's like, well, yes, dogs should be treated with respect, but if you have a dog that is very capable of hurting someone and you need to have control over them, this is the only way that you can do it, all right? This is the only way that you can do it. And the way that he feels, if he might have in the past, might have said no dog deserves to be kicked in the ribs, if... He can say, well, this dog, if he was taught that this dog is being a jerk, right, this dog was being a jerk, and I feel this dog is being a jerk, um, this starts to slowly now reflect a different type of attitude, and we get something that's cognitive dissonance, and we can do the flip side to this too, where we have the average pet owner that um, before they started um, mixing with certain crowds was maybe more balanced in their ways of doing discipline and rewarding their dog in everyday life but then they will start changing the way that they feel about something to reflect um to reflect all the all the uh, gears all right so um um they're they're working for you know they became a professional dog trainer and they took a course which taught them all about just positive reinforcement and you know not not to use punishment and then they're going to change other ways that they feel in order to reflect that and that's really what cognitive dissonance is about is people just they don't like to have conflicting things right they don't want to be able to say well i love dogs i respect them but i also behave in a way where i hang and kick them right or um they, they can't have conflict and things like that. So they're going to alter their attitude and behavior and say things that are going to reflect that. And then that is going to lead to um, confirmation bias. So confirmation bias is then a tendency to only seek out and remember information that aligns with their pre-existing views and ideas and this is why and this is all scientific and psychological stuff right so so and you will see this all around you so a lot of times if you see someone who is heavily invested in having a dog training company that is based off of purely positive training um they are not going to be reading and remembering or seeking out the studies that would reinforce that punishment, for example, can be good in, in training a dog. Or if they are highly, if they have been doing a lot of marketing, talking about dominance is not an important part of understanding dog behavior and teaching it to a client. They are not going to spend their time seeking out and reading information that supports the importance of understanding dominance. Um, and that's the idea of confirmation bias so these are real things all right these are real things that you're going to see all around you in in training and by understanding that it's going to help you understand the other trainers understand your competition understand your clients that it is not necessarily their fault right if you meet a client and they do not want to use treats when you first start doing the training or they do not want to use some sort of training collar, right? It's not, you have to be knowledgeable in the fact that they were just not born thinking this way, all right? And just like the dog, they're not just being a dick, right? They're re a reflection of their past experiences which causes real attitude changes in people which is going to reflect their behavior. And humans do have this safety mechanism in place where some people more than others, they want, they don't want their head to be spinning and being conflicted when they go to sleep at night. They are going to try to find harmony inside of their, their brain. <laughs> we see a lot of chatter. I see art has lots to say over here. All right. Um, um, so yeah, I'll, I'll go to the comments at the, at, at, at the end over here. I actually love this subject. And, but this is, 
it's pretty it, this let's uh let's let's bring it to this over here um how do we change or create attitudes um these are things that are going to relate to your consultations mostly um is and this is based off of something called the elaboration likelihood model um which is how likely you can get someone to change your attitude so so if you know the situation, you know, you have situational awareness of your audience, who you're talking to, um, and, you under, and you understand why they're more, how you're more likely to be able to change your attitude, you're going you're gonna to get a better feel of what you can do and what you can accomplish um, in certain situations. So for example, these are things to consideration. When you're changing an attitude, um, first, you have to consider consider the target. The more important the subject is to a person, the more likely, basically, you're going to be able to change an attitude. Um, if someone, if you're preaching to someone about, let's say, and you know, a lot of trainers experience this when they get their like free when they do free consultations, right? When you do free consultations or you're offering advice to, to a friend and they didn't pay for it, they don't have that big of a big of an issue, they almost rarely change what they they rarely change what they're doing, right? Because they're not that motivated. So the more someone is motivated um, that they have invested into you as as the trainer, the more that they have a problem that they definitely want to change the more generally interested in, the more they want to keep their dog, all of these things, you're more likely to make a change. And here's the reason why. Is they found, this is through studies. Um, and I do not have, I should try to pull up some of these studies. But target audiences are influenced by two different ways. And it's either called the central route uh, or the peripheral route. Now, the central route is the information itself, right? The information itself. And that is like, how valid is the information? Like, is the, is the information good? Is it presented well? Is it backed by science? Is the grammar good? Like, does this look like quality information? That makes sense from a cognitive point of view all right that's one way that um that you're going to influence them by very good information um now the other way is peripheral now this is peripheral is the presentation itself all right is someone more likely to listen to me if i'm wearing my collared shirt um, in my 5.0 videos or my K91 t-shirt in the basement, in the dirty basement of the 4.0 videos with the same exact information, all right? It's peripheral. Is the presentation being done at a seminar or is the presentation being done at the dog park? Someone's just giving the, giving the information. How, you know, it's the presentation itself. Is it, is the people, if, are they at a seminar and it's excited and everyone's clapping and the presenter is making everyone laugh, all that stuff. All these things, this is all peripheral. What they see, what they see, what they, what they perceive. Is it an attractive person on a TV show given the information? This is peripheral, all right? So these are the two ways, the two ways people will can possibly change the way that they feel about something. The information is good or the presentation is good and attractive and stuff like this. Now, what they found out is the target audience, all right, is the more someone is, um, the more someone is motivated, the more someone is motivated in something and interested in something, they're much more likely to be influenced by the central route, the quality of the information itself. Um, 
the less motivated they are, um, the less motivated they are, or the less important it is to them, they're more likely to be influenced by the peripheral route of the presentation and the bells and whistles and, and oh, look how popular this person is and all that kind of stuff, not the information itself, all right? It's not the information it, it, itself. And let me see, Art says, there's several good vids in the attitude section of the 4.0 course, confirmation by, yep, yeah, there's, um, so a lot of those things are gonna be added to the course, so the questions are, so I trim the fat off of the 5.0 version over here. Um, now, it's, so these are the things. Now, what they have found is the likelihood of attitude change, that highly motivated people, highly motivated people get a deeper understanding and created attitudes that are more permanent. For example, a lot of you over here who are watching these videos, if you are highly motivated and you're reading studies and you're listening to the facts and it makes more sense, you're much more likely the beliefs that you have in this course after doing this course are generally going to be more permanent than someone who might get some information, say from a TV show with, some, with an attractive person and with lots of jokes and people laughing and stuff like that, or even even potentially at a seminar, you know, at a seminar with a popular popular trainer um, with a good presentation, but without as much um, without without as much facts and stuff like that, you know, to to really to really back it up. Okay, so what does this mean to us as a professional dog trainer? Um, um, what's my point? What's my point to you guys? Is is when we are you want to be you want to be systematic when you're working with the client right you want to be systematic you're creating an attitude this is why follow do things in order if we're changing an attitude with someone you have someone's attention they paid you money they need to make a change you want to give them information that is based off of facts, right? You want to give them information that is based off of facts. And you also want to pay attention, of course, to your presentation, how you look, how you present yourself, how everything, all right? It's really both. The information is more important, but if you want to influence the most amount of people as possible, have go in with a good attitude. We say constant, I say constantly through the course is um, it's very important for people to like you, right? Um, even just making a presentation, a consultation, an enjoyable experience where you're, ha where you're having fun, you're not judging the people and you give good information and you use charts and you present things the right way you can create a good attitude and you need you need the good attitude to be successful going up the line you know going up to the line where cuz right after attitude what do we have right is we're going to ask someone we're going to ask someone to stick through with the training right we do the consultation if you know you can help them is you're going to be asking someone like okay i know this situation right now might be a little bit of pain in the butt with you, but maybe you're not going to walk the dog around the neighborhood for now while we're training. You're going to take them to go to the bathroom in, in, the, in the yard, right? Are they going to be willing to do that with the dog that they just think is a jerk and is causing all kinds of problems versus the dog that they just know is fearful and um, really needs really needs needs guidance, right? Are they more willing to, to lead the dog the right way, understand what dominance and leadership is, for real, instead of just doing what they always been trying to do, which was just being rough with the dog and alpha rolling the dog, um, or not thinking that it's important at all, um, and so forth and so forth. Okay, so um, in closing, let's see, and I'll take I'll take some take some questions over here, Tom. See if we covered our covered our main objectives here. What is attitude from a social psychology perspective, all right? It's 
It's all three of these things. It's, our, it's a settled way of thinking. Um, it's a settled way of thinking that's reflected in how we, and what we know, how we feel, and how we behave, right? That's our attitude towards something. Um, it's important for professional dog trainers to understand is because we're not just training the dogs, all right? We're not just training the dogs. Matter of fact, we're rarely, we're never just training the dogs, really. We're training people. We're training people and we need them to behave a certain way, plain, plain and simple. We cannot get them to behave a certain way if the other aspects of their attitude does not reflect in the way that we want them to behave. You need to address it in your consultations, all right? And it doesn't mean you have to make it obvious that and say, okay, now we're gonna work on giving you an attitude adjustment. What it means is you must make a conscious effort to make sure that you shape your consultations to develop the correct, the create attitude that's gonna reflect the behavior that you need from the clients, all right? Things to consider when you are attempting to create or alter an attitude is you need to consider that a person's attitude is mostly created by their past. Some of the more extreme attitudes too, they have been heavily influenced some often by role playing, foot in the door where they never meant to be that way. And then they slowly became that way. Then they put on protective measures to protect their sanity, <laughs> cognitive dissonance. Then as an extra shield on top of it, confirmation bias, all right? To feed that the way that they're thinking is the only right way, all right? And that's not everybody, all right? Everyone is going to, everyone is a little bit different, but this is common and this is real. And when you act this, when you, when you, when you do things this way, it does not limit you. You're able to work with a lot more people. You're able to be a lot more patient with the, with the average client. And it's very, you'll find yourself very, very limited by the amount of people that you can't work with. And if you can't work with someone you can't work with, there's, um, there's some saying, right? I just, I, I heard it and I like it. There's some saying that the bees do not waste their time explaining to the flies that the, the honey tastes better than the poop, right? Um, you know, you do the best that you can as a, a trainer, you know, you do the best, you do that the best that you can, but you're not going to be able to reach everyone, all right? And that's normal, but attitude, creating the right attitude makes you more successful. The dogs are more successful because it's based off of truth. You're creating, you make, you're turning that bridge where the truth in the dog's ethology, um, the truth that comes from the, the ethology will create the right attitude the owner should have, which creates the right behavior from them, which leads to all the successful, the successful plans, okay? Um, let me go and see if we have any questions over here before I log off. I see a lot of comments, but I wanna make sure there's no, no uh, questions, questions over here. Um, I think it's good, let me see. Arthur says, vilifying a dog is copping out, evading professional responsibility, excusing, hiding its own. Or I would say, Art, I would say that vilifying a dog is more reflective of lack of education, actually. Again, so that is, um, and that's the way that you wanna think. And that's what I want you to get from, from the stream, all right? Because, you know, uh, if a trainer is vilifying the dog, and they're copping out, that, could, that is going to feed into an attitude, right, where we're angry at these other trainers, right? And it makes it harder for us to behave a way where we can be the good bacteria and teach, um, teach trainers that are missing pieces of their education, right? So, so this is what the attitude is about, about right? Vilifying dogs, oversimplifying dogs, 
generally reflects simply a lack of education, all right? So if we wanted to change them, we go, if they were willing, all right, with the right presentation, um, um, we would, you know, we would, we would focus on those aspects that are making it difficult for them to teach the right attitude, right? Um, let's see, say so a lot of vets tell clients stuff about dog behavior that's wrong. Not all of them, yeah. So, and this is where a lot of clients, right, they come to us with behavior that's just simply wrong because, and this is important, when it comes from a person in a lab coat or a person who's in a position of, a, of, a, of authority, um, they're much more likely to take in, take in that information and that's the peripheral route, right? That's, that's the peripheral route, we wanna be aware of it. Same thing, still well, yeah, chose to be unethical, immoral. She didn't have to expose what she doesn't believe in for bucks. No one forced her to do this. She chose to do it. Yeah, and that's why ethics, right? If we do not foundation style dog training, ethics is at the bottom. If someone does not have, is not an ethical person, um, it doesn't matter. They could understand the importance of creating the right attitude and stuff like that to be successful, and it's not really going to matter, right? So ethics is a foundation for attitude. So situation like that, which is why we talk about it in the ethics stream is 100%, 100% right. Um, so good, let's see what we got over here. Kimberly says, I find the timid, fearful dogs to be more challenging. Yeah, and um, um, we need fearful, timid, timid dogs. They're more challenging but also why, again, attitude, we need the right attitude to, um, to be successful with them. And I, I'm repeating myself here, but it's so important. When I was mostly training the dogs myself, a lot of in kennel training and stuff like that, I had, I was always pre preaching, which I still believe, um, patience, respect for the dog, poise, mental balance, like, to be, if I was in a bad, if I was in a bad mood, I thought it would affect the dog. To calm myself down about something else, like, like, um, how we behave and our attitude towards a dog is very important to be successful. And it's going to be on the professional level once we're working more and more with the owner training their own dog, which really broadens what we're able to do. Is you gotta we gotta go a step further, right? We gotta go a step further and understand that. It's not just how we act, or we don't just teach how to act. We have to give people knowledge, right? The knowledge is an important part to change the way that they feel and the way that they act, all right? Because if not, attitude is very, can be, can be warped from a bunch of different, a lot of different routes. So, all right, I'm going to log off for today and I'll be back on Wednesday. And if anyone has any other questions, they could pop them in the Q&A for, for Wednesday. Thank you, everyone, for being here live with me and for your support.